Now I'd like to talk about rights-based litigation. The first real issue with rights-based litigation is determining what the content of the right is. For that, we go and we look at Section 39 of the Bill of Rights. Section 39 says, when interpreting the Bill of Rights, a court, tribunal or forum must promote the values that underline an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality and freedom must consider international law, must consider international law, and may consider foreign law. When interpreting any legislation, and when developing the common law, or customary law, every court, tribunal, or forum must promote the spirit, uh, purport, and objectives of the Bill of, right, Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights does not deny the existence of any other rights or freedoms that are recognized or conferred by common law, customary law, legislation, to the extent that they are consistent with the Bill of Rights. So that would be your starting point. When interpreting the Bill of Rights, when interpreting any legislation or conduct and trying to ascertain whether or not it is consistent with the Bill of Rights, you first remind yourself of what Section 39 says. So interpretation of legislation, for example, because this is where a lot of rights-based litigation comes from. The first, the first real thing that you have to do is look at the preamble of the Constitution. What is the spirit of the Constitution? Open, democratic society. Um, that, that is your, your underlying principle for everything. Is this in line with an open and democratic society? So then, once you've gone through that step and you've, you've said, can, is it possible to interpret this legislation and the rights that we say to have been infringed in line with the spirit of the Constitution, we then need to say whether or not the legislation is consistent with the Constitution. The first rule of interpretation really is that you need to give, the, give meaning to the ordinary, ordinary meaning of words. We as South Africa have moved into the era of plain language writing. We don't want to go and try and put Latin maxims where they aren't. We don't want to interpret in a skewed, distorted way. We don't want Frankenstein style, um, Frankenstein style interpretation of legislation. So if the ordinary meaning can be interpreted to give effect to the Bill of Rights, then we're probably not looking at any sort of infringement. Um, the other thing that, that needs to be considered, especially when we're looking at conduct as opposed to legislation, if we're examining a right that is infringed, that we think might be infringed in the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights has given the National Assembly has given Parliament the instruction to create enabling legislation to give more effect to the right, then we need to go to that enabling legislation. So, for example, everyone has the right to access to information. The enabling legislation is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. So, if we feel that our client has not been given access to information, we need to proceed in terms of the procedures that are encapsulated in the, the enabling legislation, the PIA Act. The same goes for access to administrative justice, which is the PUDGA Act, promotion of access, uh, uh, promotion of administrative justice act. Uh, PAPUDA is the promotion of equality act, and that's for your right to equality. There are many, many, many uh, pieces of enabling legislation. Right not to be arbitrarily evicted from your property. That's the promotion of. A Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act, we call it PI. Unless you're on a farm and then we call it ESTA. You'll remember this from property law. So, the, another example is that the, there are remedial measures in legislation that we also have to look at, such as um, the Restitution of Land Rights Act. It's a remedial act because it's there to provide restitution for people who had been dispossessed of their land because of the apartheid system. It's a very, very powerful piece of legislation and can be used. Unfortunately, it isn't used as often as it should be. Remember that there are levels of, of legislation as well, national, provincial. 
And when there's an apparent conflict between national and provincial legislation, the Constitution requires that every court must give preference and reasonable interpretation of the legislation to avoid a conflict. So if the, the wording on the provincial legislation seems to conflict with the, the, the national legislation, we need to try and interpret both pieces of legislation to be in line with the Constitution and avoid a conflict. What I'm really trying to say is interpretation is a way of avoiding having anything struck out. Giving constitutional effect to legislation, which is a democratic uh, legislation, which is a product of democracy, is really important. So we should try and always interpret things in line with that. Um, the constitution also requires that every court r prefer a reasonable interpretation of legislation. And when I say the court, I mean this is what you have to convince a court of that there is a reasonable interpretation of the legislation that is consistent with both international law and the constitution. That Taking into account international law is also really important. Um, earlier I referenced the blind South Africa case. A lot of international law standards are brought into argument as to why the provisions of the Copyright Act are unconstitutional. It's important to remember that international law is there and it's there to be your friend. Bringing international law arguments in is very helpful, often, to give more context and effect to the rights contained in the Bill of Rights. Um, so yeah, what, what I want you to realize is that we need to avoid applications to strike out legislation or conduct. We need to try and interpret specifically legislation in a generous way that gives effect to the Constitution. Um, so there are going to be times where legislation is completely inconsistent with the Constitution. It was obviously a lot easier to find these things 20 years ago when the Constitutional Court was still new. But um, there will still be legislation that is inconsistent. Now that we're in a, a sort of more developed constitutional era in South Africa, we have to be a little bit more nuanced about it. But there is still going to be instances where we need to have legislation struck in part or in whole on constitutional grounds. This is when the interpretation cannot reasonably stretch to give constitutional effect to offending provisions of law. Um, so... The interpretation tools are things like reading in and reading down. And I'm going to go, and when that, that doesn't succeed, then we go into severance and striking. I'm going to go into that in a lot more detail when we get to the remedies section. But please be aware that there are different kinds of remedies relating to having um, parts of legislation struck out.